Bonjour à tous. Uh, je suis Tammy, uh, and I am not going to speak any more French. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm here to talk about why performance is not just good for your business, as we've already learned, and I think most of us can agree, but why is it good for business? Why fundamentally is it vi just very good for us as human beings? Um, here we go. Oh, sorry. Da -da -da. Oops. Aha. Okay. So there is a field of study called queuing theory. Um, is anyone familiar with it? Queuing theory, Q theory, um, which is the mathematical study of how we wait in lines, how we stand in lines. And there are, if you decide that you want to dive down this rabbit hole of research, uh, there's a lot of really interesting uh, research there, a lot of interesting studies. This is my favorite one. So this is just a random baggage carousel. We're all familiar with these. This story um, takes place at a, an airport in Houston. And what they were experiencing at this very, very busy airport that has a high volume of travelers was a very high number of complaints of from travelers who were complaining about how long they had to wait at the baggage carousels for their suitcases to show up. And so the airport um, decided to spend a lot of money on hiring more baggage handlers. So they hired a lot more baggage handlers to make sure that people's luggage got from the plane to the baggage carousel more quickly. And they reduced the time from, you know, a, a, a a much greater time than it had been down to seven or eight minutes. And the number of complaints did not really change. Um, so they decided to try something a little bit different. Rather than hire more baggage handlers and try to get the baggage there even more quickly, they decided to t uh, remove the gates and move uh, uh, basically incoming flights to gates that were further away from the baggage carousels. So instead of people walking one or two minutes to get from their gate to the baggage carousel, they now had to walk seven or eight minutes. And the amount of complaints disappeared. Um, <laughs> so what does this teach us about human beings? It teaches us that we don't mind waiting um, so long as we're doing something while we wait. We need the illusion of busyness. And, uh, and at the end of the day, we're just, we're just very bad at waiting. Um, I have been fascinated by time waiting. I, I, I used to think I was a very patient person, and I realized that I'm actually a very impatient person who's wearing the mask of a patient person. Um, I, I hate waiting for anything. I'm kind of obsessed with time. Uh, being on time or even a little bit early is very, very, very important to me. And I used to think that this was very normal, that everyone was like this. And I've realized that perhaps not so much, but maybe in this room, maybe we all are a little bit like this. Um, fortunately, I have found the right path for myself and my career. Um, I've been working in web performance for about 15 years. And for about half that time, the last seven and a half years, I've worked for a company called Speed Curve where we help a lot of companies, these are just some of the companies we've helped over the years, uh, to monitor their websites, figure out how to make their sites faster um, using synthetic and, and real user monitoring. Um, I also wrote a book, which you can find if you're interested, called Time is Money, which actually, it, t it talks a, lo a lot about some of the things that Emily and Lisa talked about in their talk. Um, but also, uh, there's a chapter on the psychology of web performance, which, if I have to confess, was my favorite chapter to write, and I keep revisiting a lot of the research that's in that chapter. Um, I also help curate a website called WPO Stats, uh, which you can find at WPOStats.com, and it's just a collection of web performance case studies. So uh, these are submitted. You can submit one if you have one. Um, we love A-B tests as a, as a way of proving the connection between performance and business metrics or user engagement metrics. Um, so I highly recommend checking it out. It's very organized by topic, by um, metric, et cetera. 
So just a few examples um, from, from uh, WPO stats. Rossignol made their pages almost two seconds faster, and they increased their conversion rate by 94%, which was quite significant. Um, in another case study, Vodafone had a one-second improvement in their performance metrics, and they decreased bounce rate and increased conversions. And then in another, uh, another uh, case study from Renault, they improved their largest contentful paint time by 31% and increased sales by 8%. So these are just a few of the case studies you can find um, there. I also, over the years, have uh, directed some very interesting uh, usability studies, because my background is actually in usability. I'm not a developer. I'm not an engineer. I'm a usability person. And so I used to um, run a usability lab where I am kind of embarrassed to admit we didn't test for speed. This was a long time ago. I didn't know that performance was even a thing. Um, but since moving into the performance space, I do. Uh, I have had a chance to um, do some very, very, very interesting studies, and I'm going to get into those later on. But yes, we, this is an actual photo from a study where we put EEG headsets on people and tracked their, uh, their basically their neural patterns throughout various tasks that we asked them to perform. And similarly, there's other uh, technology that we use that's facial tracking software that um, can actually track micro expressions. So not just kind of the, the, the big feelings like anger and sadness or happiness, but all kinds of more subtle emotions. And we can track these actually visually and uh, also while we're having people uh, perform various tasks on websites. And I'll talk about that more later on as well. So what have we learned from, what have I learned from the past 15 years of doing these various studies, researching and reading case studies, and so on? Waiting is hard. <laughs> so <laughs> passive waiting, as I mentioned earlier, is even harder when you're just sitting, waiting, feeling more and more helpless while you're waiting for whatever it is, not just a web page to render, but anything to happen, is very, very hard for us as human beings. And it's not because we're bad or impatient. The other thing that's really important is to keep in mind that perception is, is not just more important than reality, but actually, perception is reality. All we are in terms of uh, you know our sense of reality is the sum total of our memories. Our memories constitute constitute our experience of the world, and how our memory works governs our perception of the world. And I'll get more into that later on as well. So let's start with just how how do we perceive time? Um, well, I talked about one way that we perceive time, that um, we, have, we perceive time as going by more quickly and we're more happy if we're doing things like walking to a baggage carousel instead of standing at a baggage carousel. Um, queuing theory also kind of yields another interesting study, which is um, if you've ever wondered why there are mirrors in areas where you have to wait, such as near elevators or inside elevators, um, it's because we actually perceive time as passing more quickly if we can look at ourselves. Um, <laughs> we just, you know, if, if there's nothing else happening and there's a mirror, it's like, okay, I'll just stand here and check myself out a little bit, fix my hair, check my teeth. Um, and and we're, we're happier with mirrors around. So um, in my own house, uh, not because anyone in my family is vain, we have little mirrors everywhere. And um, we throw a lot of parties, and uh, these little mirrors, I feel, they, they sort of, people find them comforting. Um, another thing to know is that the way our memory works, we actually don't just uh, experience time more slowly in the moment. Our memory actually exaggerates wait times. So what this means is that there can be an actual time that um, with, you know, linear time on a clock as measurable with a, with a stopwatch or something. Um, and then there is our perceived, uh, the way that we perceive time, which is about 15% slower than that, um, uh, typically. And then when we remember that weight, we remember it as being even slower than how we perceived it. So um, our memories are very interesting, tricky things. Another thing to, to know about our memory is that we actually remember the ending of an event or an experience 
better than we remember the beginning or the middle. So there's a really um, interesting, perhaps a little bit um, disgusting uh, case study. Uh, there's, uh, has anyone here heard of something called the colonoscopy effect? <laughs> I will be very surprised if anyone has. But what, what it is, I'll try to explain this as briefly as possible. Um, these are two time series charts of two different patients, patient A and patient B, who were both experiencing a colonoscopy. I am very, to date, I have not had to experience one myself, um, but I understand that they are very uncomfortable or painful. Um, and What's interesting about patient A and patient B is you can see the spikes. Oh, sorry, I should, I should actually explain this a little bit further. Um, each of the patients was given a little clicky thing where when they were experiencing intense pain, they clicked more. And if they were less uncomfortable, they clicked less. And so these charts represent the intensity of their discomfort pain. Um, and so what you can see is that the spikes are, this are about the same the spikes are about the same for both patient A and patient B. And you can also see that patient A's experience is much shorter. It's only about eight minutes. Patient B, it's closer to 25 minutes. Um, if you were to look at these charts, just look at the data, you would think that patient B had a much worse experience. But actually, in an exit interview with both of these patients, the patient that reported their overall impression of the experience as being worse was patient A. And that's because you can see that patient A's experience ended on a very painful note. Patient B's experience sort of tapered off, and it wasn't so bad near the end. So, um, so that's a just uh, the colonoscopy effect is why, for example, if you're designing an online experience, perhaps you have a retail shop, um, you want to make sure that your final checkout phase is very, very, very speedy. Because if it's very slow at the end, that's what people are going to possibly uh, remember the most. Uh, time feels slower, this is kind of the, uh, the opposite point, when we are relaxed. So the there's another study, and I do have uh, sources in a slide at the end of my slides, so you can um, access those if you want to actually dig into any of this research. Um, when the span between our heartbeats is longer, we perceive time as being slower. So if anyone does yogic breathing, um, perhaps you've experienced this yourself, where five minutes of breathing can feel like 15 minutes or something like that. Another interesting one, and please don't weaponize this against your partners. Um, women, you tend, uh, on average, to underestimate prospective time estimations compared to men, uh, which suggests that we may perceive time to be passing by more slowly. So um, I'm just giving you this information in a neutral, trusting, um <laughs> like I said, do, do not weaponize this against your partner. Um, oh, sorry, no. double slides. Um, and if you've ever thought that time is speeding up as you are getting older, I certainly feel this way, that's because it is. Um, and what this means is that over time, the rate at which we process visual information slows down. This is because um, we are, our memories are just basically, uh, we're, we're, st we're storing fewer memories um, and we're storing memory in different ways than we did when we were younger. And this is what makes time feel like it's, it's speeding up. And then interestingly, kind of a parallel stat, is that um, users age 65 and up are 43% slower at using websites than users in younger cohorts. So there's an interesting, I don't want to say multiplication, sort of an amplification effect here, where if you're already perceiving time as being more slow, and you are using a website and, and just processing more slowly, there's an interesting kind of correlation there. Our perception is also affected by how time is quantified. So these are a lot of seconds. That feels like a lot of time. That also feels like a, a decent amount of time. And you see where I'm going with this. Um, one day. 
Uh, and when you quantify time for people, they can have very different reactions to it. And that's why it's really interesting to be judicious about how we express units of time to people. And I'm going to give an aside to a funny little little funny to me little story. Um, so this is where I live, roughly. I live in a little ski town um, near the Rockies in British Columbia, Canada. And as you can see, there are a lot of trees and mountains. So if, if we want to go to another town, we have to drive through a lot of trees and mountains. And these drives are very beautiful the first time you do them. But if you're a child and you have to do them over and over and over again, they are the worst, apparently, I'm told by my children. So this is the map from where I live in Nelson, British Columbia, to a town called Castlegar. We go to Castlegar because they get first run movies before we do. So if we want to see a Marvel movie without having any spoilers online on opening night, we have to drive to Castlegar. It takes, it's 44 kilometers, it takes 35 minutes, which again, doesn't sound like much unless you're a child. Um, there's a song called My Sharona. Does everyone know this song? Okay. Um, My Sharona is exactly five minutes long. Exactly. You can fact check me on that if you'd like. Um, and what we started doing as a family quite a while ago, because in Canada, if you want to drive from place to place, you don't express how you're going to travel in kilometers because you would just like curl up and die if you had to think about it. You express how you want to travel in hours or minutes. But if you're, if you're my family, you express it in Sharonas. So <laughs> 35 minutes or just seven my Sharonas. Seven, I can do seven my Sharonas. That's not a problem at all. And this actually really fundamentally changed how we do road trips in our family, where we, we drive anywhere from four to 15 hours to get to major cities. So what I've just covered is all these variables that can affect our perception of time, sex, age, pain, heart rate, boredom, all of these things. And I hope what I've made abundantly clear is that our brains are not the linear clocks that we like to think they are. They are very, and not even um, uh, from person to person, for ourselves, from moment to moment, from context to context. And I talked earlier about memory, how memory works. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to speed up a little bit because um, I want to, I, I have a lot of slides. Um, so uh, you don't need to remember all this. What you need to know is basically we have three types of memory. We have our sensory memory, which is basically just our senses taking in information moment by moment. Um, it's working really, really, really quickly to move information into our working memory, which is uh, what we need to make decisions so that we don't accidentally walk in front of a bus or get distracted and, and lose track of what we're supposed to do. And then we, anything that's really important for our working memory, we put into our long-term memory uh, so that we can retrieve it later on. But we are constantly flushing memories from our sensory memory and from our working memory. Very little gets retained in our long-term memory. Um, Many of you might be familiar with the, the concept of persistence of vision, which is basically a very old 200, 300 year old experiment where we, uh, we know that persi persistence of vision is about 100 milliseconds. So things can feel instantaneous if they happen in 100 milliseconds or less, such as a spinning, a spinning wheel of fire. Um, this is just sort of the doorway effect. Is, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this do the doorway effect. It's that feeling of you go into a room and because you've entered a door, uh, you forget what you were supposed to do. This is actually documented, but it's been, it's a bit dubious. Um, it's, there's, there's been counter research that kind of says like, oh, maybe not. But I still like this because I think that it captures a part of the human experience, like deja vu that we all just sort of experience where it's really just our, the fact that because we're traveling from place to place, even in a short duration, our working memory has just decided, no, too long, and they've gotten rid of our sensory memory or, or whatever we, that was, was compelling us to enter that space. So I want to talk about flow for a, a minute. Um, is anyone familiar with um, the study of flow, kind of as characterized by, by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi? Okay. So... Um, 
he is a psychologist. He wrote a very famous book, Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience, which if you um, have time and inclination, I really recommend reading it. And what he basically describes flow as a state in which people are so involved in an activity, nothing else seems to matter. They'll continue to do it because it's just so enjoyable and there's they're in the moment, even something that's really, really challenging. So if you've ever... Um, that run distances and been a distance runner, you know it's a flow state. It's painful sometimes, but you are really uh, just in the moment and enjoying that feeling. And that's because human beings are hardwired to operate in a flow state. For thousands and thousands of years, we have been milking cows, baking bread, harvesting, all of these things that are seamless flow actions. Only in the past 40, 50 years have we even started to use computers. Our brains just fundamentally are not wired to use technology. So our use of technology is abnormal. Um, and yet here we are. <laughs> um, and so the state of flow, it's not about inactivity being easy. It's about it kind of engaging. It has to kind of fall in this sweet spot between um, something that's easy and makes you bored, or something that's too hard and makes you anxious. And in a flow state, you experience fun, joy, energy, and growth. Um, it can take, if you're interrupted in a task, it can take up to 23 minutes to regain focus after an interruption. And uh, flow tells us that, yes, being interrupted, having our flow state interrupted hurts our productivity, and we all want to be good corporate citizens and good worker people, and we don't want our productivity to be injured. But more importantly, having your flow interrupted over and over again int uh, intrudes on your well-being. It's just, it's simply not good for us. People who are happier, who report being happier, are people who um, engage in flow state activities on a regular basis, ideally daily. And as a little aside, um, it's very, very difficult for human beings to prioritize flow state activities. We usually deprioritize those. We feel like we have to get all these other things done. One of the best things you can do for yourself is to make sure that you engage in whatever flow state activity appeals to you on a daily basis for at least half an hour or so, ideally an hour. So where does the web come into this? Well, s basically slow sites create extra friction in a world that's already very friction filled. We sit in cars, we wait for buses or trains. Um, the world has so much flow friction that slow websites just exacerbate that. The average web user believes that they wait almost two days per year added up for websites to load, for web pages to load. Is that true? Probably not, but the fact that people say that in, a st in surveys is very, very telling. It just it shows how um, waiting kind of piles up on us. The other thing is that we say, um, in terms of wait times, uh, there have been different surveys, studies over the years where um, people are asked, how long would you expect to, pay, uh, to wait for a page to load? And people have given different answers. Back in the 90s, they said eight seconds. Now they say two seconds. It's varied over the years. And what people are really saying in those is what they feel is a reasonable time to wait, but not what they actually feel in their hearts and, and in their, their brains. Um, there's a study that says that actually a wait of longer than two seconds breaks concentration and affects productivity. This is a study that was done in 1968. So for almost 60 years, we have known that we need to having like, s like some type of engagement with t our technology in under two seconds. And anything that we say otherwise is really just us trying to think of a logical answer. Not surprisingly, this is might be why Google, um, back in the day, posited that they want, um, the reason what for, the, for their focus on web performance, um, and why Google throws itself so strongly behind web performance, is they would like all pages on the web to respond almost seamlessly in under 100 milliseconds. And not coincidentally, that is, oh, I'll go back if some of you, oops, I saw a camera, okay. Uh, that is, uh, back to our persistence of vision test. So how do people perceive speed on the web? 
Well, again, this is uh, some st research that's been revisited a few times over the years. Um, really, again, 100, under 100 milliseconds instant perception, out over 10 seconds, 10,000 milliseconds, the task is abandoned. And this is research that's done by uh, Jacob Nielsen's company, Nielsen Norman Group. Uh, and uh, this research has been revisited at least twice, possibly a third time. I, I, I might have lost track. But um, what's interesting is that it persists over time because, as I've said before, this is hardwired. When we start to interact with a page, this is actually a survey that uh, was part of a, a study that I did several years ago. And what was interesting was that about 50% of people don't interact with a page until some or all of the images of the primary images have loaded, which is interesting if you are thinking about web performance metrics like largest contentful paint or start render that are about when content begins to be visible in the browser. Um, this kind of, th the research like this is why metrics like those um, have kind of risen to the forefront. This is, uh, these are screenshots from eye tracking studies from another Nielsen Norman group uh, study where they showed that in an eight second delay, well under, under optimal conditions, this is where the eye moves on the left on the page. If there's a delay in the primary content, this yellow box, um, the eye moves down below and it doesn't actually return up to that primary content. So, um, there's another study that I was quite taken by when it first came out, I think it was 2012, um, by a group called Foveans. And this was one of the first um, uh, EEG tracking studies where they put EEG headsets on people, uh, tracked their neural activity, the brain waves, and had them go through various tasks on desktop. And what they found was a term that they coined called web stress, which was that you have to concentrate up to 50% harder when pages are slowed down. They introduced latency to certain pages and, uh, and, and realized like, oh, actually this is quite measurable. So a few years later when mobile, it's hard to believe there was a time when we had to like argue that we needed to like care about performance on mobile. Um, and so, I was very excited to do some research on it basically replicating what Foveans did with another company uh, that uh, did the same thing but for mobile. And so this is actually from our study. We gave users a set of tasks to do on shopping websites and a travel, travel websites. And what we found was that yes, people experience slowness in the moment, for example, um, these are the frustration peaks, and they were up, they peaked at up to 26% during specific phases of the tasks, browsing and checkout. But what was also interesting was that slowness, the people who experienced um, slowness, because we did divide the, our cohorts of uh, study participants into two groups, people with optimized experience and people with throttled experiences. And what we found was that slow the people who experienced the slower versions of the sites, uh, that affected their perception of everything to do with the site. So when we gave them exit interviews and uh, we ha asked them wh what their gener general impressions are of the site uh, and uh, what we took all of the adjectives, the descriptors um, that each cohort gave us and we put them into word cloud generators. I don't know where word cloud seemed to have gone away. I really love them. Um, so the fast group didn't actually have a lot to say. Generally, you can see things bubbling up. Easy to use was kind of the most, most common thing they found. And bear in mind, these are, these are the same websites. Um, the people who had the slower experience of the same website, they felt that it was slow, even though they didn't know that they were actually being part of a, a web performance study. But they also felt that, I'll kind of pull out the keywords here, the content was boring. The visual design was tacky and confusing, and the, the usability was frustrating and hard to navigate. These are th th it's exactly the same site. We also found in another study that slowness affects long-term behavior. So this is a study where we actually did a, it's a multivariate study, so basically like an A-B test, but it's ABC, where we um, slowed down two cohorts of traffic in different ways, and then we had our optimized cohort. And we ran this experiment for 18 weeks, and what we found at uh, the 12-week point was that, you know, not surprisingly, 
Um, we had more traffic for the, uh, the we were, what we were tracking was returning visits. And what we found was that even after the experiment ended at 12 weeks, well, the first part of the experiment ended, and we gave everybody, uh, we resumed fast experiences for everyone, it took six more weeks for the people who experienced the slower versions of the same site to, um, to, uh, for their to start returning at the same numbers. So people took away this feeling of the site being slow and it really damaged their willingness and desire to come back. I talked about this earlier. What we think we want does not always make us happy. Um, talk a lot about image optimization in our world. We talk about image formats. Um, I participated, I directed a study um, into different image formats and their impact on user perception, user feelings. And what was really interesting is like, you know, as, as an industry, we really love our progressive images um, over baseline images. But what we found in this study was where we looked, uh, we basically looked at people's micro expressions when they were experiencing different image renderings within uh, various web pages. And what we actually found was that, oh, we also tracked um, other neural activity as well, sorry. Um, was that actually uh, people's expressions were more neutral, happy when they were uh, viewing the baseline images, not the progressive images. So before you go and worry about switching all your images to baselines, don't do that. Um, there's a lot of good reasons to have progressive images. Uh, it's just, uh, I point this out just to kind of indicate that uh, um, what we believe we want or what makes us happy isn't always the same thing that makes us happy. And the theory behind why the baseline image made people happier is uh, this was a, a, a psychologist uh, from Mind Lab International who um, analyzed our research and kind of gave us his interpretation. And his uh, theory about why the progressive JPEG made people less happy was because uh, there's a lot of cognitive fluency. Basically, your ability, your 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 as each layer of the image progresses, um, you're working at each layer, your brain is trying to assemble an image. And if it happens not very, very quickly, then uh, your brain is just working really hard. Whereas with a, an image that's just loading from top to bottom, you're, kind of, you're taking a break, you're not really, your brain isn't working, and you're just waiting for the final image to show up. And the reason why this is the case is because our brains are constantly using glucose. And um, if you've ever experienced hanger, um, it's, uh, maybe this is a North American term, it's like you're, you're hungry and it makes you angry, so you're hangry, um, then that's because your brain is running out of glucose. It's also why at the end of the day when we've been really busy and had to make a lot of decisions at work and in life, you can't decide what you want to have for dinner or you can't even decide what you want to watch on television um, because your brain is low on glucose. And the same thing happens when we use the web. Our brain, if we're, if we're working too hard, our brain starts to tell us, um, I'm using too much glucose, this is upsetting, make it stop. Basically, our brains just want a really big, easy button. They want, it wants everything to be fast and easy. So as I said before, slowness is, it's not a thought, it's a, f it's a feeling. Um, we can't think ourselves into um, being okay with things being slow. I mean, you can hack it by maybe doing some deep breathing or closing your eyes. Or I have a friend who, back in the 90s, taught herself to play guitar waiting for pages to load because she, was, you know, she sometimes had a minute, so she would just like, work on her chords. Um, phone rage is something that we have ha has been studied, uh, where in one survey, um, you know, roughly 62% of people behave more or less normally if um, they're using a slow site on their phone. But 4% of people admit that they've thrown their phone when a site has been too slow. And 11% have screamed, 23% have cursed. I'm kind of surprised the cursing number isn't larger, but um, I feel like some of the people in the normal group are lying. Um, but anyway, at, at any rate, people have, a, you know, the actual rage. Um, I just really like this picture. Not because of this guy, because he's very unpleasant. I just like that this woman is not even paying attention to him. She's just like just doing her work and <laughs> just does not care that he's about to throw his phone. I feel like he does this all the time. Um, 
Uh, rage clicks are something that can actually be tracked. Um, and so if you want to learn more about this, uh, go to nickj.net slash measuring continuity and just sort of see the, the, the science behind how you can actually measure rage clicks within uh, on your own apps and uh, sites. And that's what it looks like. I'm Like I said, I'm not a developer, so I'm not going to pretend to understand what this means. Um, so I work with Steve Souders at Speedcurve. Um, and if you don't know Steve, he is the author of a couple of books that are kind of seminal books in our industry um, that came out in the early days, uh, high-performing websites and even more high-performing websites. Um, and what Steve wrote, and I love this, is the real thing we're after is to create a user experience that people love and they feel is fast. So we might have a lot of different roles, but wh what we all have in common is that we are perception brokers. And um, it's more it's more important to think about performance in terms of what type of perception you're creating than kind of anything else. And uh, when I say that, what I'm kind of referring to is we have these we have these performance monitoring tools. We have synthetic tools, we have real user monitoring, we have crux, and they are about focusing on specific metrics and measure giving you units of time or scores that are very numeric. But Everything that I've said up to this point is about the fact that, yes, you can have numbers on a page, numbers in a tool, but that's not really going to tell you the entirety of human experience. Our tools are crude, numbers are crude, um, because our contexts are always changing. So how do we measure perception at scale? Um, I hope you can see this. So. The, the, uh, all we can do, kind of to, because I realize everything I said just now sort of sounds defeatist, um, all we can do is, is use the tools that we have, try to use them as best we can, um, and the tools are always getting better, and uh, we're always refining the metrics we look at and how we analyze those metrics. Um, but the biggest mistake you can make is to not measure at all. So I don't want anyone to think like, okay, well, measurement is, or, or you know, performance and perception are ephemeral, so I'm not going to bother trying. You should absolutely measure performance. Um, Never, experience, never assume that your own experience is universal. So the, it's fast on my laptop um, is not, if, and if you ever, ever hear anybody say that, that's a huge red flag and you should um, run away really, really quickly. Um, you should monitor continuously, not just do synthetic monitoring because things can change and you need to have situational awareness and regional awareness and so on. Um, and as I said, you should definitely be monitoring real users. Synthetic tools are just snapshots, and they're simulations of how a page, a specific page, might render in a specific context. They're very, very crude. They're more important for the diagnostics and to actually give you a, a sense of what a real user is experiencing. Real user data is complete. Crux data is, is not comprehensive RUM. Um, uh, it's great that it's available and it has value, but it's not the same as actually using RUM. <coughs> and not focusing on the right metrics. So if you're still using metrics like load time or speed index, they had their moment, they were useful and helpful at the time, but they're not metrics that you should be focusing on now. And if you wanna talk more about that, um, I am happy to talk more during the breaks today, I'm around all day. Um, it's important to know that Corva Vitals are only available in Chromium Base and now recently uh, supported in, in Firefox browsers. Um, and looking only at averages or medians, you should definitely be measuring at the 75th percentile and the 95th percentile because you really want to understand if you have 10 million um, visitors to your site on a daily basis, uh, you know, if 5% of those visitors are having a poor experience, that's a lot of visitors. And you want to make sure that you're optimizing the entire experience. You want to eliminate confusion wherever possible. You want to make sure that people are having a seamless experience uh, going through your site. That's a usability thing, but I'm never going to stop talking about usability. Um, you want to make, if people have to wait, make the wait appropriate to the results. For travel sites, for example, is one area where people don't mind if search takes longer on a travel site because they assume, oh, they're just getting me a really good deal. They're looking at all the information, and when I get my search results, they're going to be very comprehensive and helpful. So that's an example of making the wait appropriate to the results. If you're making people wait a long time just to get on, uh, you know, end up on your landing page, that's a problem. 
Um, make sure that you're meeting or exceeding people's expectations. It's not enough to just do the bare minimum. When I talked about two seconds earlier as being a, a, a type of threshold that you could consider, that's not the goal. That should be the upper threshold. You should always um, try to exceed people's expectations. And make sure the experience ends strong. Um, so yes, if you do all those things, it will help your business. It will move whatever business or user experience metrics you care about. But more importantly, you are creating an experience that's, that's not just tolerable. It's not just OK. It's delightful. You want people to feel good using your website or your app. Thank you very much. This is where you can find me. <laughs> and here are a lot of links. So I wasn't keeping track of the time. Do we have time for questions? Oh, good. OK, excellent. All right. Uh, just with that. So my friend the other day asked me, why are we now on 5G networks and the websites feel slower <laughs> than when we were on 3G networks? And uh, I mean, we were happy when we were on 3G because Edge was slow and 3G was fast. What happened and how would you reply to that question? JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah, just a, a proliferation of JavaScript. I do um, uh, a report every year where I look at the HTTP archive, and uh, which is which measures a lot of metrics across the top million-ish uh, websites. And um, my report is specifically about what I call page bloat, and um, the thing that seems to be almost uh, a guarantee is that we can keep making our networks faster and all of our browser vendors are doing the best they can to kind of help make things render more quickly, but we just seem to want to throw more JavaScript and more JavaScript into our pages and um, yeah, that's, that's, and I'm not a developer, I'm just somebody who looks at waterfalls and I see a lot of orange bars. <laughs> You spoke about how much time we need to get frustrated, mm -hmm. but not necessarily about what content we see. Is there a modification in what we expect uh, for the content that we see that would make the content more valuable for us today than it was earlier, in, in ten, 10 years ago? Do we expect the content to have more value today? Um, so the question was, do we expect content to have more value today? And is there, is there some way to, I guess, correlate that to like what our expectations are? Um, I, I, I think the travel example, I don't know if that, that, I, that I cited is one example where um, we, we're okay with longer wait times for some things if we're researching something and we're expecting you know, to get a lot of results. We don't expect that to be instantaneous. And in fact, if it's too quick, we suspect that, you know, even, even people who don't have a, a deep understanding of how the web works just think like that was too fast. There's no way they actually did an exhaustive search. Um, so that's an example. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I mean, I think the web is the web. Like uh, most of the things that we do on the web haven't changed that much over the years. You know, we're, we're mostly online to read news articles and, um, you know, gossip with our friends on social media and things like that. So our, the use cases, I don't think have changed very much. Yeah. Um, I think the one thing maybe that I, I, I should have mentioned with the, the disconnect between like why do pages feel even slower now versus how they used to feel is, um, and, and it sort of touches on what you said as well, or asked as well, is um, the, the digital divide, which is um, 
uh, the longer we have technology, the greater the gap is between the people who have access to very good networks and very good devices and very poor networks and very poor devices. So it's easy for us if we just look at our own experiences and those of, you know, kind of the people in our environment to think, oh, everybody's on a relatively fast device and everybody has a relatively fast connection. But there's a S globally, a huge number of people, and these are even in developed countries, like you know, in Canada, rural communities, indigenous communities, um, where I live. Y uh, if I leave um, my s my town and I drive for long enough, the connection gets very, very, very poor, and it can be qu actually quite dangerous if you need to access certain services if you have an accident or something like that. And there's certain services that just don't work now because the pages are three, four, five megabytes in size. They have a lot of non-performant JavaScript, and or you know, or non-performant under slow connection. Um, you know, kind of environments, and it's it's quite hazardous to not be able to use the web. So the web, um, I feel, you know, there's a, a, a growing feeling that it does not serve everyone in the world, and in fact that the number of people that it's not serving well is growing. So. Hi. You spoke about the longer corridors in airport uh, to have a sense of uh, less uh, waiting. Uh, what about uh, skeleton screens in UI? Sorry, what about, S oh, skeleton screens. Ske skeleton screens. Um, so I think I don't have actually any data on that. So anything that I say right now is going to be very hand wavy and just personal opinion. Um, kind of extrapolating from from other things that I've read, um, is that anything that um, requires you to wait for something, you know, something renders, and then you've got to wait for something else to render. It's that uh, it's anything that inhibits cognitive fluency, our ability to process what we're seeing on the page in a seamless way, is not really a great solution. Uh, but I, you know, context is everything, um, and the speed that, you know, with which it's rendered is really important. So, um, kind of a related example is progress indicators on a page. So, progress indicators are really helpful until they're not. So, um, if, if um, they're, 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 they're pointless if your page actually renders really quickly because they actually give you the illusion that your page is slower than it is. So, if your page renders in like, less than four or five seconds, but you've got a progress indicator, people feel like it's slow, which is kind of interesting. Um, if your page takes much longer to render, and it's not a really important page, like a search result page, and you have a progress indicator that is running for a long time, that also makes people feel the page is too slow. <laughs> so there's, there's kind of a sweet spot, and I don't know what the current research is on what the ideal time is, but, it, but to have progress indicators on your page, you need to have a very, very good idea of how quickly that page actually renders for most of your users, or else you're possibly hurting their perception of, of performance. So I digressed, but I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> I answered a different question that was in my head. <laughs> Another question? So, thank you, Tammy. Yeah, thank you. Merci.